What's up, everybody? What's up everybody and welcome back. It's been a little bit. A lot of stuff going on as you can see behind me. I guess that means it's 4th of July. That's right. 4th of July weekend. Big weekend on the lawn usually. Big groups of people. Big fun. Big barbecues. I don't know what you guys are doing. I'll be spending time with my family. I'm looking forward to it. Maybe getting up back into the back trails of the mountains and uh, you know making it a little bit of a unique experience this year because really there's one thing that you can say about 2020. It's been unique. Next thing, this is the fourth, already, can't believe it, fourth spoon feeding week. So that obviously is going very well. The grass is super dark green. It's growing in nice. I brought up the level a little bit. I actually just mowed it at two inches, so that's, that's where it is now. But it's still kind of creeping up as we go here, so that's kind of fun. The next thing is, the turf mend is filling in pretty well, so we're looking at uh, seven days since I put that out, and it's, it's filling in. So I'm pretty happy about that. But today we're gonna be talking about something completely and totally different, and here's what it is. So now that we're officially in summer, here's some of the things that are happening. People start to look at their lawn, and they're like, maybe the color isn't right, maybe it's yellow, they don't really know what's going on. So there's really only a few things, and we're gonna go over those today, plus talk about water rates and a lot of this is going to apply to you all that don't have in-ground sprinkler systems that might be spot watering with hoses uh, who don't actually get a lot of natural rainfall like me so here is what we're going to run through today let's talk yellow lawns now this is an area of my lawn that notoriously gets these sort of yellow spots if you want to call it but back here there's only really two reasons for that number one where I set my sprinkler in the lawn doesn't really get good coverage up here. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. When I plant, I put the turf down here, I ended it about here. Actually, there's a line right back here that you can kind of see here. 
this is all just the bluegrass that's sort of crept up the hill. And I'm just sort of letting it go and letting it be natural and it doesn't really bother me. But this area, like I said, is just outside the sprinkler line. Now, the second thing that can happen up here is let's say I do get enough water up on this top side and I, I get it where it needs to be. Well, if I come through here with my uh, string trimmer and hack this all down, that's gonna cause a bit of yellowing back here as well. So that's two things. So one, it's a bit of lack of water that's going to be pretty easy to identify. And the second one is putting the stress in by cutting too much off the leaf blade. So let's look at another thing real quick. So this is gonna be the other area. And it's that same thing. It's like breaking the one third rule and going too deep and being too aggressive and causing some fraying of the leaf blades. And that's more of a problem here. So you might be seeing some of that yellowing because you're taking too much off the grass at a time. And again, take a look at the mowing cultural practices video and you can kind of get an idea on that. But that's going to give the lawn just a slightly yellow look. And I'm gonna show you an example from a little further away as we do sort of a bigger overview of the lawn. So let's just recap. We're only on water and mowing those two things. That's pretty much it. We haven't gotten into disease or anything like that. Mowing, watering. So Danny got pretty excited about his lawn and kind of cut a little bit extra off that he needed to. Now you can still see that the color actually still looks pretty good. I'll see if I can go up here so you can see it better. It's still doing really well. Now remember, I'm doing a spoon feeding. This is just doing that once feeding and this is not coming up due for another two weeks. We're still two weeks away from feeding that one. So the color's good, but you can see that he cut down a little bit too low. And so it kind of gave it just a little bit of that Eh, kind of cut into the undergrowth and kind of gave it that little brownish look. Hey, our garden's sure doing well. Hmm, veggies. Okay, so that's the mowing and watering piece, and that's, that's really all that is. It could potentially be causing yellowing. Now, I don't really have a great example of yellow here, just because, obviously, I get to take a little bit more care of my lawn, and it's not really that big of a deal. The next one is going to be nutrition. If you weren't strong enough feeding coming out of the springtime, and getting your lawn what you need, it's going to struggle. It's going to struggle a bit more than it should if it didn't have enough gas in the tank. And, and I think that that's a very important thing to look at because it's really hard to play catch up on your nitrogen, especially in cool season turf, in the summertime. You can cause disease and that's really no fun. However, in these situations where I've had people who are low on their nutrition coming in, maybe they got scared of something fungal or, or, or something like that, I tell them to start to spoon feed it back in so that they're not playing catch up later on because you can lose a lot of your turf if you don't give it enough nutrition and it'll just struggle and thin out. Then you're gonna deal with weeds and you're gonna deal with a whole host of other things. So it's better to just sort of micro feed your way back in and just bring it back up to pace and catch it up as quickly as you possibly can without overloading everything at once. So while I'd love to get into diseases here, I can't necessarily because I can't showcase those. I can't uh, give you visuals here on my lawn or on any lawn that I take care of um, that would give you that sort of visual on what particular funguses look like. But I I'm, I'm, will say this now, there are certain uh, lawn fungus that feed on nitrogen or nitrogen gives them a little bit more strength to spread or propagate, however you want to look at that. Um, again, I, I want to say don't fear the fungus. Use a fungicide when you need to, but make sure that you are feeding as well. You are putting something out to control that fungus, but if you do not give your lawn enough nutrition, it is ultimately going to suffer a worse fate. So just keep that in mind. I think the next thing to talk about is how much does your lawn really need in terms of water? What is it really going to take in order to keep it healthy and green through the growing season? And when you hit peak of summer with bluegrass, we need about inch and a quarter, okay? Inch and a quarter. And that sounds, you know, well and good, but you need to know exactly how much water you're putting out. So I took a couple of different sprinklers that I have here just to find out what they're doing. So the first thing I did was I timed what my total flow rate was of my water. And I put that into the bucket and I'm getting about six gallons a minute. That's not really super high flow, mainly because I live up on a hill and my pressure isn't that great, but, but it's enough to do some simple math. Now, I took my rotary impact sprinkler, threw that down, that goes exactly at five gallons. So it's doing five gallons per minute. And then the same with that sort of stub sprinkler 
that's just more of a fountain, good for spot watering. That one also does five gallons per minute. So we're doing five gallons per minute on every single one of those. Okay, so let's do some simple math here. So 620 gallons of water gives you one inch of water over a thousand square feet. Now that impact sprinkler, it'll do about a thousand square feet, but I have a total of about 1500 here. So I need a bit more than that, right? To get everything out. To get to that one inch, I need 930 gallons. Okay, that's just one inch. So add another quarter on there. Let's just say for rounding sake, we're at 1200 gallons. 1200 gallons to water everything out here at 1.25 inches. It's pretty simple math. So if I take this whole thing and I do the math on it, I've got uh, 1,200 gallons divided by five. What do we got there? 250, right? Yeah, well, two, yeah, 240, 240 gallons. Okay, so 240 minutes, that's what I should have said. 240 minutes in order to get my entire lawn done that's how much time it's going to take during the week to water. Now, right now I'm not putting down even an inch a quarter. I'm probably putting down around uh, maybe three quarters of an inch a week. I would say that's pretty close to accurate because I'm not watering 240 minutes a week, not a chance. Now, if I take that smaller stub sprinkler, I can move it three times across the lawn. Then I can run it for say 20 minutes. So I can give hundred gallons, hundred gallons, hundred gallons, just like that. And that will do water that really for a while. I, I, I will feel comfortable not having to water for at least a few days. Then I could do that again. So now I'm up to maybe 600 gallons. So I'm still nowhere close. So if I did that three times a week at that same pace, eh, I still don't get there. It's not going to get me up to the number of that inch and a quarter, right? So I think it's vitally important that you know what your flow rates are. Now there is that whole thing with the uh, tuna can or cat food can. Listen, if you're buying tuna in a can, I, I, tuna in a can is cat food, change my mind. I think that that's the piece that a lot of people miss is they tend to just set their sprinklers to a certain rate and they let it go. And they don't really have enough monitoring of what's actually happening and how many gallons are going out to give them that actual inch of water. And a lot of the time, again, like I mentioned with fertilizer, you're going to have to play catch up. If you were doing too light a watering, your roots really aren't going to be very deep and your grass is going to suffer a bit more. So it's important to do a very super deep watering, super deep watering. And depending on your soil type, that could take different amounts of time. So the one thing I always like to do is just to make sure that there is soil moisture down at least to six inches. And that should be your sort of measuring stick for everything. You may think that you're getting enough water, but if you don't have moisture down six inches, you're probably not getting what you really need because you're only feeding into this top surface to refill the water levels. So it is vitally important to work that water back down because it's the old analogy of the wet sponge, dry sponge. You can take a pail full of water and drop a sponge on it and it won't absorb anything. You could take that same sponge, throw it on the ground, dump a bunch of water on it. You might get a little bit, but if it's slightly moist, if it's got a little bit of moisture in it, it will actually hold more water and your soil is the same way. It's a series of chambers and spaces and it requires a little bit of moisture in order to take in more moisture. So really that's all I wanted to cover off today. It's just making sure you've got your water right. You're getting it down right. And here is the simple way to check it. I'm only going to explain it. I mentioned it earlier. Get the can out, get the can out, do the water. Every year, all of us guys that are talking about lawns, we talk about the can, the tuna can, the cat food can, just to check and see how much water's going out. Set it out in the middle of your sprinklers. Fire everything up. Time it. See how long. Run 20 minutes on your sprinkler. Measure how much is coming through that can, and that's basically what you're getting. So you need to just figure those levels out so that you know you're getting enough moisture. One of the things that you can calculate down on is this, and this here's how I look at things. I have a small water, I don't have a small water company. I'm part of a small water company here. I have a bill that is $70 a month. That is what I pay for water for my standard allowance, which I believe is 18,000 gallons for my household. I have not had a bill above 70 bucks since I put the turf in when it was getting a lot of water at that time. So, I mean, when I really take a look at it, what my household usage is and what the lawn usage is, like I said earlier, if I'm having to put 12 to 1500 gallons a week out, four weeks a month, well, let's say maximum of 6,000 gallons, okay, 
that's only part of it. I still have quite a bit to use between myself and my kids and whoever else might be staying at my house at the time. We have more than enough in that allotment. Now, some places, it's not like that. You have water that just flows. They kick on the uh, secondary irrigation system and you can water as much as you want to. And maybe it costs you $12 a month, 18 bucks a month. Maybe your concern isn't as much. But in areas out here in the West where you are paying and you are metered on water, it can get really, really expensive. So it's important to know what you're getting out. It's important to make sure that you're watering efficiently. And it's important to, to look at things like this. If I have one dry spot back here, I just have one dry spot. There is no reason for me to soak the entire lawn. That doesn't make any sense. I need to focus on that area and I need to build up the soil moisture in that spot, not worry about the entire thing. So that's something I really want to stress about. This is true in so much of lawn care where people tend to go way to the other end of the spectrum without really thinking things through. If I had one small spot of fungus over here and I had a 10,000 square foot lawn, I'm not going to spray fungicide on the entire lawn. I'm going to treat that area and I'm going to leave that alone. If I had a dry spot, I'm not going to soak the entire place. I'm going to treat that one spot. You have to sort of think things through that way. If you have one weed over there, you don't have to do the entire place. Take care of that weed, right? Like you need to really think about compartmentalizing your own area so that you don't go crazy with either your budget or just over application of things that might not necessarily be what is needed. So that's it for me. I just wanted to wish everybody once again a happy 4th of July. Please be safe out there. Come back and see me. I'll be back on the lawn in no time. I'll talk to you guys real soon. See ya.